Welcome to a special edition of Off the Clock. Recently, there have been three major employment law related regulations dropped by the federal government. We are quickly recording three episodes, one on each regulation to make sure you are up to speed as quickly as possible and have your takeaways about what you and your organizations need to do next. On this episode of Off the Clock, we're gonna talk about the new Fair Labor Standards Act regulation that was just released. Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. I love talking about the Fair Labor Standards Act, and no one believes me usually. When you believe me. I do believe you. But when I say that because to clients, I can see it. I can see it. I, I can feel the excitement. When you say, hey, I have a client. Right? With an right. issue, can you, I, do I light up? Yes, you do. Yes, uh, I do. And I'm sorry for all of you that have problems <laughs> that cause that, but, but I do love talking about it. This one's not terribly exciting. It feels a little bit like Groundhog's Day, to be honest it, with you. It does. But nonetheless, uh, let, let's tell people what they need to know. And with each one of these new reg minis, if you want to call them, we're going to talk about what the regs do, Yes. Uh, what the litigation situation is, and what clients, employers need to do. Yes, you got uh, it. In short order. Perfect. Okay. Sound good? Does that, that sounds great. Okay. So let's start with what this, what this new reg does. What does it say? Uh, in short, it raises the minimum salary threshold for certain exempt employees. Right. So just to level set for a moment, uh, to be exempt from overtime. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have to be paid a certain way usually on a salary basis, with some exceptions. Right. You have to be paid at least a minimum amount, usually, there's some exceptions, and you have to perform exempt job duties as your primary duties. Right. This regulation impacts that minimum amount. Okay. That's the only thing it impacts, okay? So we're just talking about one out of three. Yes. Uh, but don't, I don't want people to forget about the other two, yes. right? We I still know. have to make sure people right. are performing exempt duties. Uh, and if people remember back uh, to 2016, not everyone listening or watching was in HR back in 2016, so I don't want to assume everyone remembers that, but the Obama administration tried to significantly raise the minimum salary, and just on the eve of the effective date, a court, where, Sarah? Texas. In Texas. <laughs> just a court in Texas. Uh, said that the regulations were void, essentially, and so no one had to comply, and poof, they went away. Now, okay. that's not really true. There were lots of appeals and legal action, but then the administrations turned over, um, but no one really had to comply. To do anything. Okay. The Trump administration raised them, but not a whole lot. They got to around 35000 and there was no litigation challenging that. Now we have a new final regulation that bumps up that minimum amount quite a bit. So it's currently 35 and change. That's what it's I, currently what 35 said. and change. Mm -hmm. uh, the new bump up comes in in phases, which is different than what we're used to. So that I'm, I'm going to get you the actual numbers, but let's yeah. just conceptually, so we're all on the same page. There's a new number as of July 1st. And then it bumps up again in January, on January 1st, and then every three years, right. just to make people crazy, on July 1st. Not the calendar year, but <laughs> July 1st, you may have to adjust wages. Okay, so now, what are the numbers? And here I have to look, because I do not remember numbers. This July 1st, July 1st, 2024, the minimum salary to be exempt uh, is $844 a week, which equates to $43,888 per year. Got it. Per year. That's how it's stated on an annual basis. But of course, the FLSA is always, it starts weekly. Uh, on January 1st, that number bumps up to $1,128 a week, which equates to $58,656. Got it on an annual basis, so that's, let's say, 58 and a half, which is higher, frankly, than what was expressed in the proposed regulations. Yep. And then every three years thereafter. 
on July 1st, so three years from this July, so right. starting with July 1st, 2027, it will increase according to current economic data. So Got not it. by a set amount, but they'll look at what's happening okay. with wages and inflation. So those are the numbers. And as I understand it, a certain percentage can be attributed to bonuses and commissions and yes. things like that, right? 10% of it. Up to 10%. Got so it. if it's if you're using the 58,656 number, 8,000 or yeah. whatever, no, 10%, 5,856 dollars can be uh, commissions, bonuses, uh, what I would call variable mm -hmm. income. What's, what's kind of neat about the final regulations is that because it's variable, people don't know at the beginning of the year. So how do you know if someone should be exempt or not? Right. It give, the final regulations give you a chance to true up at the end of the year. After December 31st. Got it. So okay. as of December 31st, if the variable income was not enough combined with the non-variable income to get to that minimum amount and you had classified them as exempt and you want to make sure that classification sticks, in the on the first payday after December 31st, you can make that correction and true them up. Got it. Okay. Uh, so that's the bonuses and commissions, the highly compensated employee level, which frankly we don't get into that often. Those numbers were also uh, increased. There's a special carve out for school administrative right. employees. Okay. So kudos so to the education who, lobby. Who are in ed education, they should know there's different rules. for Yes, them. There, there, there's a carve out that administrative employees, their minimum salary can be equal to the starting salary for new teachers in that educational institution. Got it. Okay. okay. But so let's get to the question that everybody really wants to know. The lawsuits. Yes. Right? That's exactly. Wait a minute. That's the number one question oh. that I'm getting. That's my um, number one question to myself. Two. Because I've done this before. So <laughs> um, not just I've done this before. Strauss, you told me yeah. <laughs> to do all of these things and created all of this disruption, right? right? In my workplace with my managers, reclassifying people, and sometimes we even made it effective, right? Because we wanted to get ahead a little bit, and then all of a sudden we didn't have to do it. You got it. So is this just crying wolf all over again? Yep. So what uh, do you say about that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's the short answer, but let me explain a little bit. I don't have a crystal ball. There is recently uh, a Supreme Court Fair Labor Standards Act decision that has to do with day rate and exemption taxes, which we are not going to get into on this show because it's only fun for me to talk about. But I bring it up here because two of the justices in their dissents yeah. invited this litigation, said that if the salary basis was challenged, it would likely be thrown out. Interesting. Okay. So, it, so right. to me, and I, just to predict, I really don't know, uh, but the legal basis for the lawsuit that's currently pending and probably others that will be filed is pretty strong. Strong, right. But what does that mean for all of us? Because just because one plaintiff files a lawsuit in one court does not mean there's going to be some sort of stay, right, that puts the regulations on hold for the whole country. It could, but it doesn't necessarily. It could, mean that. but not necessarily. We've become conditioned to that because of several things that happened during COVID. Mm -hmm. The most significant was the OSHA testing requirement. Remember, and a right. district court issued a national stay and everyone, that the no one had to comply with it. There has been pushback on that concept, and I'm not going to get into the weeds yeah, on it. Right. Let's just leave it at that. There's been pushback on the concept that one judge can issue a national stay. Okay, so let me see if I can get... So in the short term, right, because that's what we're looking at here. The question I'm getting is, will this be... Will this go away before the effective date of July in January? Mm -hmm. The answer is only if a judge issues a state for it issues a stay for the states in which you have employees. Correct. That's the answer. And mm -hmm. we can't we can't predict whether that will be true or not. Now at the end of the day, once this thing makes it all the way through the courts and goes up to the US Supreme Court, it could get invalidated. Yeah. But that but takes time. It's between now and then yes. that we're not we're not certain about because that's within control of federal judges and the jurisdiction in which stays apply. Yes. 
And right. so by the time the Supreme Court were to speak on this and could void it on behalf of all of us, that just takes time. Okay. That's not, that's not going to happen. It's going to be a long time. Okay. Uh, so probably so our listeners July. need, so there, it, we know there will be challenges filed. What's important to our listeners is whether those challenges result in some sort of stay that actually applies to them. That applies that's to them. That's the key part that they need to, okay. Yes. So then in the meantime... In, in the, the meantime, meantime, what should they be doing? Again, Groundhog's Day a little bit. It's going to sound like what I told people in 2016, but there are a lot of similarities. Start your review and planning, but don't pull the trigger yet until we have a better, until closer to July right. 1st, right? When we have a better feel of where the litigation is going, if a stay has been issued, sure. et cetera. I don't think it will help your organization to get ahead of it and just do it now, right? Because we don't have confidence. We don't know. We just don't know. Right, what's going to happen? So, so do start with a review. And I should also say, regardless of the law, this is a great time just to review exemption classifications anyway, because if you're going to make changes, it's just a great reason to right, right. a change in the law. Right. So start with your creating a list of your exempt employees and rank them by salary, not by department, right? Not by job type, just literally by salary. See which ones fall below right. the new threshold or are close, <laughs> right? And think about whether you want to give them a raise or reclassify them. Might want to. Yeah. Like, right, exactly. We're yeah. not saying do it now, but right. think, start thinking think about, about if this, if, what decision might be if made. If this law becomes effective, this, what yeah. are we going to do with mm -hmm. Mary Jane? Yes, got it. Right, who earns 35000 a year. Does have exempt duties. In other words, get start getting your arms around the potential impact of this yep. on the organization. Start. What does this mean? I, and I would, I would think most of our listeners probably want to be in a position to be able to explain what this would mean, assuming it goes forward for the organization. Is it a million dollars? Is Correct. it a hundred thousand dollars? Is it twelve thousand dollars? Right. We need to know for all of those people how many hours they work generally. Right. Right? And HR leaders, frankly, oftentimes don't know. So you're going to have to work with uh, your leaders, mm -hmm. right? your frontline supervisors, et cetera, their, their leaders, to figure out what their schedules are like, if they're predictable, if they're not, if they often work over 40 hours or not, because right. that could impact your decision and how to proceed. Yes. You're going to want to think about, for some organizations, how folks being reclassified are going to keep track of their time. Mm -hmm. right? what, are you, what are your options? For that, and is there going to be additional overhead cost in that, right? If you have to subscribe, get additional licenses for timekeeping software on laptops, right? I mean, so this is an additional potential right. cost. Are you going to have a time clock on the wall? Are you going to have just blank pieces of paper, right, where people can jot in their in and out time, which is not great evidence, but perfectly legal to keep track of time like that, right? You're going to want to think through all of those things and have your ducks in a row. Okay. Um, and to your point, calculate what the overtime will look like because your business leaders will really want to know yes. for budgeting purposes. What's the cost? They need to know the projection. As, as, as business leaders have told me, we can handle any news, Rebecca. We just need to know about it in advance. <laughs> right? We need to know for budgeting and everything else. We just can't be taken by surprise. Right. That's the worst okay. thing uh, for business leaders. So that is what to do now. Okay. Um, in addition, if this hasn't happened already, get in front of your business leaders, right? Your CEO, your CFO, right? HR leaders, to the extent HR leaders are listening and not uh, others from their organization, send this to their, mm -hmm. your CFO or CEO or talk to them about it so it's on their radar. Yep. I think that's right. Just one other piece that I've heard you talk about, um, if if an employer has somebody who is exempt and the need is to move them to hourly, mm -hmm. there is a way using math, <laughs> right? <laughs> to figure out what the hourly rate should be taking into account assumptions about over yes. about likely overtime, right? So, so all things being considered, if it's clear that some exempt employees might need to be moved to hourly. I just want to say that out loud. That is not the end of the world. That, oh, no. can, that can be accomplished, and it can even be in, accomplished in a way that's not um, an added cost to the organization. That brings up two okay. additional thoughts, so okay. thank you very much. Yes, yes math. That's, it's my most hated four-letter word. <laughs> 
I know a lot of them, and frankly, that one bothers me more than all the others. Right. Um, there is a lot of advanced Fair Labor Standards Act that we can get into. Yes. In terms of how to pay people, how mm -hmm. to pay non-exempt people. Right. In ways that employers may not have thought about. And using math, right? right. Making sure even with overtime, there's no additional... Uh, cost of the organization, yes. like with all of the new regulations, we are, Miller Johnson is going to be offering additional education and training Great. for people who are interested. It's to beyond, get really into the, it's beyond the scope. It's okay. yeah. We need a blackboard and chalk, right? We're okay. talking that. So it's beyond the scope of off the clock, Okay. Uh, but we know, we know people need support in this area and we'll be looking for creative solutions awesome. and we will uh, roll those out for people. Okay. Uh, my other thought is this. Uh, employees heard the news, right? It was on the news, on CNN, it was uh, all yeah, over the place, sure. uh, that more, so many more people were going to be entitled to overtime. Mm -hmm. I personally believe that the more communication, the better, even when you don't actually have news to share. Right. The fact that you don't have news to share should be shared. Yeah. Right, or else people will think maybe you didn't hear about it, you don't know, you're scrambling, you're mad, you're going to fire people it's to keep costs down, right? There's a lot of feelings and emotions that might be swirling, right, on your shop floors, so to speak. Right. So think about HR, the CEO, sending a note saying, we heard about this, we're, right, we're working on compliance, right, and how we're going to adjust, stay tuned, just yeah. something along those lines. It Makes doesn't, sense. you don't have to have Makes the answers sense. yet. No one expects you to have the answers yet. Okay. So takeaways, right? You, everyone heard the amounts. That's yes. fairly objective. You can include additional pay bonuses, things like that in calculating it. That's new. We think there will be legal challenges. The question mark is whether a stay will apply to you, to you <laughs> and your business. Right. In the meantime, we recommend you start getting your hands around what will need to be done, and, it, assuming that this moves forward on July 1st. Absolutely. Perfect. Well said. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Rebecca.